Well, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to um, share God's Word um, this month. I'm really excited to see where God leads us and how He's going to work. Um, before we get started, I'm going to pray real quick, and we'll dive in. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you that though there is smoke, we know that there is blue skies and there's a sun above, and Lord, that you are still in control of everything that is going on. I pray that this morning you would just make me disappear, Lord, that your word would shine, that your name would be glorified, and Lord, that you would challenge and encourage our hearts this morning, um, that we would go out just passionate to just serve you more um, where you have us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of James this morning um, all month. Um, we're going to be, the sermon series is Faith in Action. Um, we talk about all the time, well, we need to serve God, we need to follow Him, but in order to do anything, you have to act on it. And James all about that. Um, he was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Um, he did not believe God initially. Initially, um, Jesus said, well, I and the Father are one. James did not believe him. Neither did his brothers. Actually thought he was crazy. And John 7, 5 said that none of his brothers believed him. In the book of Mark, um, chapter 3, says that his whole family thought that he had lost his senses. And while was teaching inside of a house, they came up to take him away because they thought that he was crazy. Um, but it did not stay that way. Um, Jesus, he um, died on the cross, he rose again, and then James believed. You really are who you say you are. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to James, so he saw him physically, um, and later James served with Paul for a time. And Paul even considered him a pillar of the church. If you look in um, Galatians chapter 2, it says that Paul is talking, saying James and another brother are pillars of the church. Listen to them. And he became a really a principal leader in the Jerusalem church after the apostles began their ministry abroad. So time and time again, he gets together with Paul, the other apostles, and he became a leader in the early church. Um, and eventually, he was martyred for his faith. Um, and this is the man who wrote this letter to the church. Um, it was likely the very first New Testament book written. Um, so it's the oldest one. It was written between uh, 46 and 49 AD. Um, Jesus had already ascended into heaven by that time. Um, and Christians um, lived under constant oppression and threats. Um, look in Acts 3 through six for that until finally the stoning of Stephen and the church is scattered abroad because of persecution. So this is why James writes this letter. He's like, hey, all of you Christians who are scattered out, um, I want to encourage you and I want to en encourage you to live out your faith, not to get comfortable where you are and not to just be happy with the status quo of the situation that you're in, but I want you to actually act on the things that you've learned. We're called to be messengers of God, spread the gospel, disciple all nations. And James like, hey, that still stands right now. Um, and at the time, the church, they wouldn't meet in buildings like this. They were dispersed. They were in hiding. They would often meet in homes. And a lot of times, they would have a meal. They'd have a time of worship. And then when um, they, the time came, they would read some of the Old Testament scriptures, or in this case, it was a letter. James wrote this letter. It's like, hey, to the dispersed church abroad, this. And not everyone had a copy of the letter. Okay, we'll turn to this paragraph. It was, okay, we're going to sit down. We're going to gather together. And one person read the entire letter, uh, or in this case, and now it would be the book of James, to the people to encourage them, hey, this is a letter from James. Um, let's gather and see what he has to say. We're not going to read the entire book this morning. Um, but it is great to have sit down and read through it. And, oh, well, all of this is interconnected. It wasn't originally divided into chapters and verses. Um, this is James pouring out his heart, um, his heart to us. 
Um, so we're going to be in James chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 20. Um, the title of the message this morning is Faith in the Midst of Trials. Um, so in James chapter 1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, where you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he should receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a flower. For the sun rises with a scorching heat and weathers the plant. It blossoms and falls. Its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about in his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted by his own evil desire. He is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not shift like changing shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, do not... Do take note. My <laughs> dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of life that God desires. Right. So faith in the midst of trials drives us to seek... Go back again. Uh, faith in the midst of trials produces joy in spite of circumstances. So in verses 2 and 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, where you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Um, so faith in the midst of trials produces joy. When you think of a hard time, it's not usually, yes, it's, I'm going through a really difficult situation right now. It's usually, I don't know about you guys, sometimes I get stressed when things get really hard. And I don't know what's going on, and I don't see any good outcome. I'm just like, well, I'm just going to try and figure this out. Um, but joy doesn't come from our circumstances. It's not something that we can just conjure up in ourselves. I'm just going to be joyful and enthusiastic and happy about everything. It doesn't come from our minds. It doesn't come from our wills. It doesn't come from our emotions. That comes from God. Um, true, lasting joy comes from the Lord. Um, during whatever circumstances we face, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. If you go into Galatians, is the second fruit that is listed there. First one is love and joy. Um, that is, comes from the Lord. It's not something that comes within ourselves. Um, so Galatians 5:22 through 23 says, "But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. There'll never be a law against it." But all these things don't come from within ourselves. They come from the Lord. When we're following the Lord and we're seeking Him and we're during these trials that are coming up to you, instead of getting anxious and frustrated and closing down, you can trust in the Lord and He will give you that joy during that trial. 
Romans 15, 13. It says, God fills us with joy. Um, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, it comes from God, not something that we can just suddenly have. Um, we can also have joy because the trial is not meaningless. Sometimes the hard situation comes up, like, what is the point of this? Why do I need to go through this and walk down this road? No one else does. No one ever else ever goes through anything hard. It's always me that gets these things. That's not true. Um, everyone goes through hard times. Everyone goes through trials. Everyone who lives God, who seeks to live God, will also face persecution if they are living their faith out of some, um, in some way. But it is not meaningless. Um, and Scripture says in Romans eight twenty eight um, that God, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. So He works these things together. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows everything in between. When He created the world, He knew. Well, okay, well, there people are going to turn against me. They're going to sin against me. I gave them free choice. They had the choice to choose me, or they had the choice to choose sin and rebel. We chose to rebel. But he, since he knows everything that will ever happen, he knows, okay, well, these trials, these things that are going on, I can work these so my glory can show in their life. So they'll be drawn to me. He knows. And he, our trials are not meaningless. They have a purpose. And in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, um, we should rejoice. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we know that during these trials, during these hard times, we can still have that joy. We can rejoice because God is perfecting us. He is refining us. Um, so we can reflect him and give him the glory and the praise in the end. And that Jesus' Jesus's name will go forward. Um, and it's not just happiness and trials, but joy. Happiness, anyone can act like they're happy. Um, it's, but it's fully contingent on what the situation is. Like if I go to the walking down the street, I find a twenty dollar bill on the ground. You know, I'm gonna be happy for a little while. It's like, wow, I found twenty dollars. But the, that's in the moment, then it's gone. You know, I go out to eat, it's gone. <laughs> Happiness is lost. No more twenty dollars. But joy comes within. Comes from the comes from the Lord. And how is that? How does this joy come in? It's by walking with the Lord in the midst of your trials. So if you are walking with the Lord when things are going great, things are going okay, you're going to keep walking with the Lord during these trials. You're going to find that peace. You're going to find that joy that God gives. So what does that look like? If you've been coming to church any length of time, you've probably heard these before. Read your Bible and pray. Um, we get so used to hearing those things, fellowshipping with, other, getting together with other believers and talking about how the Lord is doing in their life, what's going on. Those will draw us closer to the Lord. And then setting your minds on things that are above. So often, if you, if you turn on the news, it's really easy to get bogged down. Just give it about one, 30 seconds, and you can look through it, and it's like, okay, well, I've had enough of this. But if you're constantly feeding yourself all these things that are going on, it's going to drag you down. But if you're focused on the things that are above, God knows everything that's happening. He has always known, and He will receive the glory in the end. <laughs> But focus on the things above. God has called us all to disciple nations, to, to share the gospel with the people here in Bonanza, here across Oregon, across the country, really around the world. He has called us. If we're focused on the things that he has for us to do, 
and the promises that God has, then we can have joy in the midst of trials and hard times that are going on. So faith in the midst of trials produces joy. Um, if we're taking notes, number two is faith in the midst of trials drives us to seek God through prayer. So verses 5 through 8 in James chapter 1. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts and is, is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. True faith doesn't allow us to run from God. Um, it's, it can't. If we're really trusting God and we're really have, placing our faith in Him, we know that we can't run away from Him. We just heard, I think it was last week, the story of Jonah. He tried to run away from God and we learned what happened to him. He still ended up going to Nineveh. He still proclaimed the word of God. Um, even with a resentful heart, he still did it. And God, God still received the glory for it. The nation repented for nearly a hundred years. You cannot run away from God. And true faith drives us to God when issues arise. It drives our eyes upward toward, toward the help that comes from God. <clears throat> Not into our own bag of self-pity and self-isolation. And it's like, woe is me. If you're trusting the Lord um, and walking with Him, then these trials are going to push you closer to God. You're going to seek Him during these hard times. Um, one example in the Old Testament is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Um, king Jehoshaphat um, is king. And it says, this is in verse 1 through 4, then verse 12 is his prayer. It says, Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon together with some of the Muonites came together towards against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea of Aram. And behold, they are in Horizon and Tamar. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah, so that Judah gathered together seek help from the Lord, that they, may, they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. <clears throat> and then in verse 12 is his prayer. It says, O Lord, we cannot face this vast army that's approaching us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So it could have been very easy for Jehoshaphat to be okay, well, we've, we've been in wars before. I know all these armies are coming against us, but we've, we've won them before. Let's just stand our ground and dive into it because we've done it before, even though there's a great, huge number of armies. It's like, oh, wait, let's take time. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. We're going to seek the Lord first before we do anything. Though he could have just grabbed his resources, he could have grabbed what armies he had immediately and said, okay, well, we're just going to charge in and do it in our own strength. But he chose, not just for himself, but for the whole nation to take time and fast and pray over what was going to happen. And they were over overwhelmed. It says that we... <laughs> O oh Lord, we cannot face this vast army that's approaching us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. <clears throat> it's often those times when we don't know what to do that we become frantic. And we're like, let's just get something done. We're going to try and fix it on our own. <clears throat> From my experience, it doesn't work very well when I do that. 
So faith in the midst of trials um, also produces victory and steadfastness over sin. Um, so with trials, again, we're often tempted to rely on our own strengths, our own abilities, um, past experiences, and our possessions to get through a situation. When a trial comes, it usually doesn't come expected. Like, okay, well, I've, it's going to come on Tuesday the 15th, so I'm going to be ready on that day. It, it comes, we just have to be ready for it. If we're focused on the Lord, we'll be ready for it. We will always fail in trials if we rely on our own strength and abilities over God's. Our hope and joy is found in the promises of God alone. In 1 Peter um, 1, 3 through 5, it says this, it says, Blessed be to God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So this is our promise that he has a place. He has rewards in heaven waiting for you if you are following Christ and you are standing for him. Um, he has these things for you. Um, uh, we often hear, you know, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. These are, when Paul wrote that in Philippians, he wasn't like, well, okay, well, I, I can pick up this giant rock or whatever. It was before leading up to it, he said, I know what it's like to be um, healthy. I know what it's like to be fed and have all the things I could possibly desire, but I also know what it's like to have nothing and to be imprisoned by myself. He knows what it's like to have plenty and what, to, what it's like to have to be in need. And then he goes into, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that is a promise, too, that through Christ in any situation, whether it's a trial, any kind of trial, he will bring you through. You just need to rely on him for your strength. And we can't allow ourselves to be so wrapped up in overcoming the trial that we open up <clears throat> temptation that is knocking on our door. Back to James 9, um, 1, 9 through 15. Um, the brother in her humble circumstances ought to take pride in his low position, in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises, and the scorching heat comes and withers the plant. It blossoms, the blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed in the same way. The rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he attempt tempt anyone. But when one is tempted, he is enticed by his own evil desire. <clears throat> he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So in verse 13, it says clearly, God does not tempt you. Um, it is our own desire. But first, there's temp to have temptation is not a sin. It's giving in to that temptation. So first, there's temptation. There's temptation to be fearful during these trials. There's temptation to be like, well, I can handle this. I can just rough my way through it. I will just fix it um, so everything will be better. I'll put a Band-Aid on it and it'll go away or ignore it. There's a temptation to do those things. But when you give into it, then that gives birth to sin. And ultimately, sin gives birth, goes, leads into death. <clears throat> So as we face trials with faith, we can have victory over 
sin because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Christ has already faced these things. Um, scripture says that he's been tempted in every way that we are, yet he did not sin. And that is why he could be, he could pay for our sins by dying on the cross because he did not sin. And, and he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the tomb. He rose again, um, defeating death. Um, now he's in, in heaven um, preparing a place for us. So we've looked at how faith produce, and during trials produces joy. We've looked at how it produces um, victory over sin and the situations. We also, faith in the midst of trials also allows us to show the world that we belong to the one true God. The world is always watching, especially if you say, hey, I, I believe in Christ. I'm a Christian. I follow him. Then their eyes are going to be glued to you, just watching every single thing that you do. Um, James says that every good thing comes from above. It's in verse 16 through 20. It says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not shift like changing shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we may be the first kind of fruits he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God that God desires. Therefore, that's verse 20. <clears throat> so every good and perfect thing comes from above. Um, you may be thinking, well, a trial, a trial can't be good. It's like, well, if every good and perfect thing comes down, then this trial can't be from God. Well, God is working this trial out for good. When we endure this trial and we're persevering through it, it produces endurance, it produces patience, it produces steadfastness to be able to keep going. Most of all, it turn, should turn us to God. Romans 8, 28 again, all, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. God works all things together for his good. Even if it's not what we expect, well, I want this good thing to happen out of this trial. That, that's what we want. That's what we desire. But is that part of God's plan? If you are on board with, okay, Lord, I will, whatever you bring out of this situation, I know that you're working it for good, even if it doesn't end up the way that I expected it to be. In the end, we'll find that it's, that it's actually much greater than we could have ever imagined it turning into. So what does it say about God and about us when we respond to hardship and anger and slander and in violence or simply by just checking out? How many times when you give, I'll just point at myself, I'm sure none of you do this, but if you get frustrated and you're like, I just need to go somewhere and isolate, now let's go to my phone and let's kind of, what's going on with the world right now? Nothing good is really going on that we focus on. But we just isolate and just kind of bring ourselves out of the situation. You're like, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here until I feel better. And over time, you see, you come back, come back out. Like, okay, I'm better now. I had my time of isolation from the world as I dove into the world. So, but what does it say about us? when we do those things, when we respond to trials and we just get angry over it. And people know, hey, they say they're a Christian, they say they're following Christ and their hope is in Christ. They have joy in Him, but every time something hard comes up, they just get angry. Or they start slamming someone verbally. Or they fill in the blank. There are so many ways to respond. What is, how is that sending the message out? What message is it sending out? We're called to be different. We're called to be set apart, really to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and follow him. 
So that means that's not just when things are going really easy. It's also with here in trials. We have been adopted as co-heirs of Christ, daughters and sons of the King of Kings. So in our reactions and responses to these trials that are going on, are we reflecting that? What do when other people look into our lives like, well, they, this thing happened. I don't know if they're actually serious about what they believe in or do they even really know what they believe? <clears throat> is it just something that we say, you know, Jesus is my Lord? So what do they see? Do they see when they look at us as we're responding to these trials and going through them, do they see a joyful people? Do they see a people who's praying and who's victorious over sin? Do they see Christ in the midst of it? Like, yeah, this is difficult, but God is getting me through. Or do they see a people who's just tired and angry and defeated during the trial? It all comes back to who is your hope in? Where is your strength? Like what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19, on that we share in the sufferings of Christ. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? <clears throat> and if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So what are we doing during trials? Are we really trusting in him? Do we have that joy that he gives in the midst of trials? Do we really know that there's a point, that there's a purpose to things? God is working things together for good. Do these trials drive us back to God? Or do they drive us further apart into our own pit? Do our reactions and response to these trials, do they show that we belong to God? And do they build us to be stronger for him? We heard some of the things that are going on this morning during prayer time. Um, some trials that people are facing. That trials that we're praying for other people to be able to have strength to get through. I know that there are many other things that are on our hearts this morning too. There's like, well, I, it's in the back of my mind. I keep praying about it, hearing about it. Maybe it's something that came up this morning. It's like, wow, this is just too big for me to handle. It may be personal. It may be in your family, maybe a friend or a coworker. Um, but how is your response to that? Are you being joyful in it? Are you being trusting to God to walk you through this or to walk them through it? Are you overcoming the, trans the temptation to just give in to <clears throat> your own desires and to check out or avoid the situation? Um, as we close, we're going to 
Um, just have a time of prayer. If you, if there's something that God has laid on your heart to bring before him, um, feel free to come, come up and pray on the altar. You can pray in the chair or the pew that you're sitting in. If you want someone to pray with you, um, feel free to grab me. You can have any of the deacons. If you're a woman who would prefer to pray with the deaconess, grab a deaconess. Grab someone to pray with you. Um, um, but we're just going to take a few minutes um, to um, just come before the Lord. And if there's anything that's on your heart, bring it before Him this morning. If the, if the music team wants to come up and play as well, you can. Um, um, if, you, if you do not know the Lord, and you're like, well, you've been talking about trials, you've been talking about trusting in God for um, strength during these trials. He gives you joy, he gives you peace, he gives you all these things. You're like, well, I don't even know the Lord. I don't know who Jesus, really. I've heard about him, but I have never really made him Lord and Savior of my life. What does that mean? What does that look like? How can I have joy during these trials if I don't even know him? Well, that's a great question. Um, if you don't know him, uh, I want you to know that Christ, well, in the beginning, God created the world perfect. He placed man in it to take care of the world. And he gave man a choice. Are you going to follow me or you follow your own desires? He gave us the ability to choose. God created us in our, his image, perfect and without sin. But man rebelled against God. It separated the relationship between man and God. But God, in John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God gave his only Son to pay for our sins so that one day we can be back into a relationship with Him. And by ex accepting this free gift, Jesus Christ, to pay for your sins, um, we'll be able to spend eternity with Him. We're no longer to be punished in hell for our sins because Christ has already paid for that. If you have not done that in your life or yet, and you're thinking, well, I need to. I haven't done that. We don't know how much longer we're going to have here on earth. Christ could come now. He could come a hundred, a thousand years from now, but we're not promised tomorrow. So if you haven't made that decision yet, um, you can come see me. You can see any, anyone here. You can see me after the service. I'd love to talk with you about that. Um, but if you do know him and you're going through a hard time, this is trials, um, just bring, bring what is in your life before him now, whether it's in your seat or here or wherever you feel called. service over to Hap. He's going to lead us in communion. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being here this morning, Lord. Lord, I don't know who this message was for, Lord, um, but Lord, I know I'm, I'm convicted by it. I pray that you would all give us all the strength that we need during the trials that we're facing every day. Lord, give us your wisdom. You tell us that if we just ask for wisdom, you'll give it to us freely and generously. So I pray that that would be our heart, that you would give us wisdom, Lord, for the things that are going on. I pray that we be obedient um, to follow your leading, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.